<clears throat> okay, <clears throat> Albert Schreck. 1903-1998, born on October 18th, uh, a Swiss architect who became uh, the promoter of uh, desert uh, modernism in the United States. Let's read a little bit about him. But before we read, let's look a little bit of, at him. This is actually a picture in his own house, that huge, huge, huge rock behind him uh, was uh, was indeed uh, real and uh, I think is a remarkable house he built for himself and we are going to see it and it's actually it was described as a Zen building uh, and uh, it's just a coincidence that today we'll also talk about Zen architecture here he is uh, cocky like most uh, architects with his uh, beautiful um, automobile what can you do about it? Architects love cars. And maybe cars love architects, I don't know. Anyway, it's a nice car, obviously, and the Swiss architect seems to be quite happy in front of it. Here he is uh, with an image of uh, his first house, the first house he built for himself. In this presentation, I will only show the second house, which to me was more interesting, but I should have presented this one too. It's a deficiency of my presentation. Anyway, uh, Albert, uh, Albert Frey, as you can see, born October 18th in 1903 and died in November 1998, <clears throat> was a Swiss born architect who established a style, a style of mod modernist architecture centered on Palm Springs, California, United States, that came to be known as desert modernism. Not bad. So, uh, born, in, uh, born in Zurich, Switzerland, Frey received his architecture diploma in 1924 from the Institute of Technology in Winter, Winterthur, Switzerland, or Winterthur, yeah, I guess, Switzerland. There, Frey trained in traditional building construction and received technical instruction rather than design instruction in the then popular Bazaar style. Prior to receiving his diploma, Frey apprenticed with the architect uh, Arthur in Zurich and worked in construction during his school vacations. It was also around this time that Frey become aw became aware of the Dutch the steel movement, the German Bauhaus school and movement, and the modernist movement developing in Brussels. All would prove to be significant influences to phrase uh, a later work. Sorry. From 1924 through 1928, Frey worked on various architectural projects in Belgium. In 1928, Frey secured a position in the Paris Atelier of the noted international style architect Le Corbusier. Well, I wouldn't call uh, Le Corbusier an international style architect. Anyway, I took this text from <clears throat> the Wikipedia and Pierre, Pierre Jandre, who was the cousin of Le Corbusier. Frey was one of the uh, two full-time full employees of the atelier and co-workers included Joseph Louis Serre, Cunio Maecava and Charlotte Perion. During this period, his period of working for Le Corbusier, Frey worked on the Villa Savoie project and other significant projects. In 1928, Frey left the atelier to take up work in the United States, but continued to maintain a friendship, uh, a friendship with Le Corbusier for many years. Now, again, this, this uh, text is from Wikipedia. I noticed that uh, there is something a little bit strange here. In 1928, Frey secured the position in the Atelier of Le Corbusier, and also in 1928, Frey left the Atelier to take up work in the United States. So I guess he worked for less than, than, a, than a year in the United States. Anyway, he did interesting works. Uh, here you see, I found it on the web, Villa Savoie, architect Le Corbusier, project architect, Albert Frey. Uh, so the, from various sources, it seems that indeed he was the project architect for um, 
the celebrated building by, uh, by Le Corbusier. Now we start from 1931. So he was quite young. He just arrived in the United States and he built the Aluminaire house together with Laurel Scholar, a very interesting experimental house designed for the Architectural League of New York ex exposition. This home was designed by Frey with help from A. Laurel Kocher. It was made to be affordable and easy to reproduce and was built in 10 days. The Aluminaire house was the first all metal prefabricated home in the United States. This is the building and I think it's nice. I, I like it, you know, and uh, the metallic look I think is, is a plus. Uh, I think he said that uh, he chose, I hope I have here uh, uh, another uh, quotation from uh, Albert uh, Prey why he chose uh, aluminum to, um, uh, to build this house. Uh, it's not bad. I mean, even uh, using today's uh, standards, aesthetical, uh, not just uh, technical or constructive, I think it's a good building. 1931. So three years after Villa Savoie of Le Corbusier was built, Albert Frey built this one in the United States. This is an interesting idea to interrupt the continuity of the of the covering above the terrace to bring natural light into the into the the actual rooms, and I even like the shape of the. It's it's skillfully done. Now this uh, enclosure around it is a new addition. Uh, initially, the building didn't have it. It's possible that it is closed um, the most of the time. Anyway, this is how it looked like in 1931. Now the Kircher Samson building uh, also, I'm not sure if it was built uh, before the Second World War or immediately after. But this is also a, a, a good modernist building. I think it's, um, it's um, you know, it's still fresh somehow. Um, and here it is, uh, you know, in, in the present. It's easier to look at, at it, uh, you know, in all the pictures because there isn't so much uh, going on around it. A nice, a nice clean uh, plan, so to speak, uh, and uh, it works. kind of interesting that at south or towards south, I see mostly blank walls. Uh, I wonder why he did so. Okay, moving forward. Uh, and uh, here it is a view from the air. Sorry about the resolution is the, the only uh, picture I, I, uh, I came across uh, seen from the air, but it can still be seen. 
Now the Cree house, number two. Uh, he's, I think he liked the stone and uh, this is not very usual for modernists. So you have the, you know, the, the typical uh, modernist house, almost, almost typical, because the typical uh, modernist house doesn't usually have, uh, you know, this, uh, this canopy, uh, uh, you know, extending beyond the limits of the walls. So this is a little bit um, peculiar or, uh, you know, novel, but otherwise, you know, it, it's a modern, uh, it's a modern house. Uh, and uh, I think the, the presence of the stone and something. Uh, Marcel Breuer used to have uh, also buildings built, um, uh, you know, uh, private residences where he used stone for certain parts of the building. And I think uh, somehow the stone and, um, you know, uh, balances uh, an architecture which is otherwise concerned, I mean, built mostly with the glass and, uh, you know, white walls and all the rest. As you can see, stone is gray, it's not white. So all that uh, title by Le Corbusier called Le Cathedrale de Blanche when the cathedrals were white, I don't think Mr. Le Corbusier saw, saw a lot of stone in his life. Most of the stone is gray, it's not white. And we are going to see beautiful stones also in the Zen architecture of Japan, equally gray, not white. But the you know the uh, the admirer of eugenics who wanted to have everything white as Le Corbusier was at the beginning of his life, uh, even the cathedrals had to be white. Otherwise, he he would have thought that they, they were not pure enough. Well, the only white thing here is the car, or at least uh, most of it. Anyway, this is an old picture. You can tell from the car, but it, it is uh, it is it is a picture taken after the Second World War. Anyway, um, moving forward, Albert Frey. He was a good architect, and he deserves to be known. Uh, you know, uh, mid-century aesthetics against stone, which was which is not white. Uh, he obviously loved stone, and I think the, the, the most splendid project he did with stone is uh, his own house, and we are going to see it soon. But he, the, at that time, there was an optimism, you know, about uh, everything, you know, people left behind the Second World War, and there was a trust in, um, you know, progress in science, in money, in, uh, in everything. And he worked for Palm Springs, Palm Springs California. So uh, he's even called uh, the Palm, Palm Springs uh, architect, the one who built Palm Springs. So you can imagine. Now, Louis House, built for the industrial designer, a very famous one, Raymond Lowy, in 1946. Uh, again, a, a luminous uh, kind of international style architecture. He brought, he was not the only one. There were other European emigres who built on the west coast of the United States, meaning in California, like Schindler or Neutra and others. Uh, but Albert Frey is one of the, the most important ones. I mean, just to, just to build a private residence for this famous industrial designer was not a little thing. Well, who said that life is difficult? <laughs> or unpleasant. What could be more pleasant than to, you know, uh, be in such a house with those fruits uh, near the swimming pool and, uh, you know, pleasant uh, uh, company and so on. Uh, yes. <laughs> At that time, the United States, um, you know, by the way, today I, I, I learned that one of the, the important political figures of the United States, the former General uh, Secretary of State, Colin Powell, died of COVID 
complications, as they put it. It's true, he was 84, but to my knowledge, he's the most famous person who died of COVID until now. And you can, he was fully vaccinated and he also received, you can imagine the best care possible and he died. But it's true, he was 84. So, you know, he was not so young any longer, but still it shows that, uh, you know, this illness, uh, not only that it didn't go away, but uh, is, is, uh, is making victims um, still all over the world. And Romania is at the very top in this field. If we are not at the very top in other fields, we are in this one. We finally managed to show what it means to be, uh, you know, uh, on the front line of something. It's, it's very sad what is happening. Okay, now uh, <laughs> I look at these pieces of furniture and uh, you know, they amaze me with that, uh, with, through the, you know, with the fact that they are not at all uh, high-end uh, modernity. You know, we are dealing with an industrial designer of the highest caliber, but it seems you know, even Le Corbusier had old uh, furniture. It's something about old furniture. It's still charming, even those with or an orientation towards modernity. But all in all, of course, it's a pleasant house to live in and the landscape is majestic and everything is fine. Except this, in my opinion. I, I think when Albert Frey uh, handles uh, curves, he becomes a little bit conventional. And actually, I only show here his modernistic structures or buildings, but looking through his larger body of work, I have to confess, he also built some very lamentable buildings, you know, very conventional and, uh, you know, commercial. And I obviously did them for money, but uh, they depressed me. So I didn't include them in, in this presentation. This is the house and uh, you see the curved part is here. He, I think the building, if the building remained without this, uh, you know, this thing, uh, it would have been better, but that's my opinion. Anyway, now the Frey house, which in my opinion is excellent. Uh, Palm Springs, I, 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 um, I should have added an S after the G of the word spring. He built two houses for him. I only showed the second one he built and is this one. And uh, I like the fact that it's, you know, it, it uses elements, you know, constructive elements, which are not expensive and, um, you know, they are not glamorous. And I like this, this aspect of his architecture. Even the city hall in Palm Springs is done in this way. Uh, and uh, yes, the rocks are magnificent. And look at this, look at this giant, giant rock, which supports the, the roofing here, uh, and even enters the room. I think it's brilliant. I, I, I like this very much. I understood it was a very difficult uh, site because of the, of the presence of, the, of this uh, rock. Uh, you see, it enters the bedroom almost ominously, but I think it's beautiful that, of course he could not have removed it. I mean, it was, I don't know how many tons of, of stone, of rock. Um, and I read, I hope I have here the text that, you know, he transformed the deficiency, if we are to call it so, the presence of the giant rock on the site into, a, into a, an asset. And look at this. I think it's brilliant. I mean, you know, <laughs> can you imagine? Now, only now I noticed, did he cut a door through it? If he did, it's sad. I hope he did it. I hope here is some kind of a mirror or something. Uh, I don't know what you think. I just noticed this, but, uh, I hope he didn't, he didn't cut through the rock because if he did, uh, I think it's lamentable. It, anyway, 
uh, but uh, otherwise it is quite a, an original uh, room i have to confess i mean frank lloyd wright also used a stone he found on the site where he built the falling water uh, to for the uh, you know uh, the the pavement of of the of the slab or in the living room but here we are dealing with the with the Moby Dick of rocks, so to speak. Anyway, so this was his own house, the, the second house. And you can see it even through these, although there are reflections, but you can see it, uh, you know. Uh, but I, I, I am afraid I did something. I think I chose, I think I had another presentation uh, called uh, Albert Frey CC. And I think, uh, no, no, this is the one. Because I ha I work on very on 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 on, on uh, alternative uh, PowerPoint presentations, and this is the one. Why? Because because I I wanted you to read this uh, short presentation of this house. It is described in a journal in Palm Springs. Simple, durable, zen, iconic. Albert Frey turns a multi-ton boulder, that huge rock into its centerpiece like um and i continue with the text because it's it's kind of uh, it's an advertising but uh, it's it's well written so frey house number two is the steve mcqueen of mid-century houses maybe you know who steve mcqueen was was a famous american actor at the time like the actor the house is the essence of cool without trying to be cool it knows what it is, and it does it better than anyone else can. Handsome, simple, durable, zen, iconic. Both photographed well, but filled the frame even better for motion pictures. Frey House number two is the second of two personal homes designed and constructed in Palm Springs by legendary architect Albert Frey. He studied the precise positioning of the hillside and its relative solar patterns, both summer and winter, long before he started building in 1963 on a piece of land many doubted could be tamed. When the dust, dust settled, he had achieved the impossible by turning what seemed to be his biggest obstacle into what he knew all along would be his biggest asset a multi-ton boulder in the middle of the property, which now serves as a touchstone of the house. Uh, just a second, I have to remove this thing. Frey house number two is located at the top of a private road that's very steep. So you can imagine the challenges when the house was under construction bringing steel and concrete block and all the materials up there and also just the lot itself nobody i think i think the one who wrote this text uh, would ever imagine that it was desirable because it was so steep and such a difficult site but albert took that challenge on says sydney williams curator of architecture and design at the palm springs art museum it was this spirit of quiet confidence imbued with vision, poise, and genius that filled the project before, during, and after its construction. Because of those qualities, the house is an indelible reminder of the sheer beauty that can be willed into existence in face of adversity. And like its silver screen counterpart, Frey House 2 is, and always shall be the essence of cool. I like this um, this fact that uh, this short text uh, understands and promotes the idea that you can transform adversity uh, into into its opposite. And I believe it is true. Uh, you know, uh, you can you can achieve uh, sheer beauty. Uh, uh, you know, in the in the face of adversity. So you transform a deficiency, a problem, into something that is beneficial. I, I believe it is true, at least, uh, at least sometimes.
Okay, other images, uh, you see the bedroom, the big, big rock uh, in, in the proximity. And this is the view. Um, it's actually the entrance into the building is done through this thick wall here. Yeah, you, know, you can see here. I'm not so sure about this. Again, I, in my opinion, if you would have just kept the rectangularity of the building would have been better. But uh, again, this is my, my subjective uh, uh, perception. So this is the, the, the Albert Frey second house, the one he built for himself, the set, you know, a little bit later. Now we go to, a, um, it's called aerial tramway uh, in Romanian is funicular or stație pentru funicular at Palm Spring. And this is the building. We are going to see big rocks also, uh, and uh, when I'll make the presentation about Zen architecture. But this is interesting too, I think this building, and this is a public building, it's not a, it's not a private residence. So it is the birthday of this, I would say, important uh, Swiss architect who built a lot in, uh, in the United States uh, on, the, on the West Coast. Now he worked with a firm here. He, he, he worked actually with various partners. And you see here at the bottom on the right, Williams, Clark and Frey architects. But it's possible he was actually the, the main designer. Palm Spring Aerial Tramway. And the winter view, the landscape quite uh, quite spectacular there. Okay, now we go to Palm Spring City Hall from 1952. So he built also the the city hall in Palm Springs, and uh, I like the way you know so emphatically he allows the uh, you know the palm trees actually to to to. Uh, launch themselves towards the highest heights. Um, you know, it's not a very complicated or complex architecture, but 1952, and you are going to see some very interesting things. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about these uh, this decorative panels. I don't know exactly what their role is, but you will see that he, he did them in a very innovative way and probably in an inexpensive way. But for the, you know, for the front elevation of the building, you would say the, the palm trees are the, 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 the big stars. And they are tall indeed, as you can see. Uh, I only hope they were not planted here specifically for the project, but that they were found on the site. Again, this is fine, but I think what is here is not fine. And it reminds me of postmodernism, and I wish this was not here. I'm not against curves in general, but in his work, I think wherever he assumed the curves, he became a little bit, um, you know, passe, so to speak. But look at this, although you could say there are, there are curves here too. Well, there's something different here. But I like this, you know, this incorporated this. Uh, I don't know, I don't think they were, you know, manufactured specifically for this project. It's possible that he found them, you know, uh, somewhere and uh, employed them for this. Uh, and I like this kind of tech, techno look for a building which otherwise is not techno look. Uh, and, you know, with simple means, but, but I think it's effective. And, uh, you know, the look is still fresh. 70 years later. 
uh, essentially it's it's a decorative element you know but uh, it works and it's a city hall it's not a private residence So I, I do believe you, you can, you can uh, build in, in an interesting way with so-called found objects at Dedeman or, you know, stores that sell construction materials already made, you know, uh, prefabricated, uh, and you employ them in, a, in an unusual way, and you can do interesting things in a not expensive way most of the time, like in this case. And you know, this is, I think, a good thing. This is not an expensive architecture, and it's not an architecture that is emphatically representative. Again, this is a city hall, and yet the building looks, it could have been anything, a school, you know, a kindergarten, anything it could have been. Uh, the, this wall maybe, I don't know, I, but uh, otherwise the modernistic international style look, I think is fine. Uh, even 70 years later. This is what bothers me, and I, 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 I kept saying it, and I keep saying it. He should have got rid of, of, of this nonsense here. I, I, I don't know why he did it. But again, I have seen what other works by him which are almost unpublishable, so I didn't publish them. Anyway, now, tramway gas station designed by architects uh, to mark the interest to the modernist um, Mecca. Uh, that's because Palm Spring, Palm, Palm Springs, California is considered a modernist Mecca because there are many modernistic uh, buildings, uh, mostly um, you know, private residences built there. So the tramway gas station, it was a gas station, but uh, lately I understood it was uh, transformed into an art gallery and maybe even later uh, it became a visitor center. Uh, it's a good building by these architects, Albert Frey and the Robson the Chambers. Uh, and look at this. In, from this view, maybe it's not so uh, spectacular. This uh, curved uh, circular wall was built later, uh, but uh, you know, after after it was not used any longer as a as a gas station. But let, let me read. Completed in 1965. It remains one of the first buildings visible to those traveling south along the road from Los Angeles into the Californian desert city, which experienced a boom in architecture from the 1930s to the 1960s, having worked together for over 10 years as partners at the Palm Springs space firm Frey and Chambers, Swiss born architect Albert Frey and Robson Chambers from Los Angeles had already completed several projects as part of this modernist movement before working on the gas station. And here is the gas station, um, you know, ex expressionistically launching itself through its roofing uh, towards the sky. And, uh, you know, indeed, it is, uh, it's still a, a remarkable building Remarkable because of the of the covering, uh, you know, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, almost expressionistic, and uh, you know, it's not very common to find many gas stations in the world that have this um, uh, expressivity. As I said, this curved wall uh, was was built later. And yeah, now it has this function, Palm Springs Visitor Center, and it's possible that uh, the, the function of an art gallery is still uh, on there. Albert Frey, Palm Springs, California. 
Okay, so happy birthday to Albert Frey. And now I will talk about um, Zen architecture uh, because because today is the birthday also of a, a very important um, uh, personality in the field of uh, Zen uh, culture and Zen, uh, Zen spirituality. And that is the reason I chose to, to talk a little bit about uh, uh, Zen architecture. Uh, the subject is vast, I am not an expert, but I want to be, uh, I want to become an expert, especially, uh, I, no, I don't like experts, but I want to know more because uh, Zen, Zen spirituality is something that perhaps is, is very needed today in our time, because it's essentially about contemplation and uh, renouncing, uh, renouncing uh, materialism, uh, renouncing the obsession with uh, having, and it's more about knowing. Uh, and uh, there is much to say about, uh, about that. So this short presentation is in memory of D.T. Suzuki. Who was D.D. Suzuki? Uh, here is a picture of him. He was born today, the 18th of, uh, of uh, December, of uh, October, sorry. So let's read. Uh, Daesetsu Teitaro Suzuki. Uh, he rendered his name Daisets, but uh, I'm not sure I pronounce it well, I guess. He was born the 18th of October, 1870, and he died in July, 1966, was a Japanese scholar an author of books and essays on Buddhism, Zen and Shin that were instrumental in spreading interest in both Zen and Shin and Far Eastern philosophy in general to the West. Suzuki was also a prolific translator of Chinese, Japanese and Sanskrit literature. Suzuki spent several lengthy stretches teaching or lecturing at Western universities and devoted many years to a professorship at Otani University, a Japanese Buddhist school. He was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1963. So let's wish him happy birthday. And let's see a few things related or, uh, you know, uh, possibly relating uh, related to, um, to Zen from the field of architecture. I will show now uh, modernistic structures, uh, contemporary structures, actually. Um, there is a, a website from which I took uh, examples of uh, such contemporary works, um, you know, relating to uh, the Zen, Zen spirituality. The Zen architecture, Eurasian Serenity, it's a text by uh, Till Mag from Brussels, Belgium from 2016. So this text was written by him with Tadao Ando's Vitra Campus Conference Pavilion gleaming in the mind, deeper research reveals that Zen architecture has become something entirely different than Zen Shuyo, Zen, the Japanese Buddhist style derived from Chinese Song Dynasty architecture. Liu and Ishizawa, uh, the one of the two partners of Sana, the other one being uh, Kazuya Sejima in, 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 in Japan, makes this clear in an interview about the Teshima Museum. There must be some relationship between our architecture and Zen, but actually I don't know how they relate. The following selection exemplifies this dichotomy. A wooden bridge museum in Yusuhara, Japan by Kengo Kuma. Uh, this is the website of Kengo Kuma, and you, you, if you want, you can, uh, you can access it and study further this building. So the structure of Wooden Bridge Museum in Yusuhara, Japan, creates a cantilevered building using local material, red cedar suji. It is suing two buildings, a hotel and spa, are separated by the cliff and road, while the infrastructure hosts an artist in residence program. The charming Kengo Kuma design building merges 
into the forest around it, responding to the aesthetic naturalistic concept of Shizen. Accumulation of uh, Corbel evokes the traditional construction of to kyo square framing employed in Japan and China, devised to support the load from the eaves. This solution requires traditional craftsmanship, but also brings out the potential of laminated wood. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I wish I had more time at my disposal to add more pictures. I only have one picture of each building that I show at the beginning. But this, I hope, will stir up some interest. And again, who is interested could see more pictures and descriptions of the, of the building in the website of Ken Gokuma. Uh, Ken Gokuma, who received the Dr. Honoris Causa prize, um, or uh, yeah, on, uh, yeah uh, prize, I guess, at uh, the uh, University of Architecture in Yonminku in Bucharest uh, three years ago. And I was there in the auditorium when he when he was present together with um, with the Japanese ambassador to to Romania. He works with a lot of wood, and uh, I, uh, I'm not sure if I didn't ask him actually at the conference. Uh, or I wanted to ask, I, 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 I don't remember, but I think I asked him about this the extensive usage of wood at a time when we, when we should abstain, in my opinion, to, to cut wood down. Now this is laminated wood, but still, uh, anyway. The Shonan Christ Church designed by Takeshi to Hosaka, a six skirt roof props up the scenic design of Kanagawa, in Japan's Shonan Christ Church, designed by Takeshi Hosaka, taking inspiration from Ge Genesis Six Days of Creation story, these six concrete elements allow natural light to pour in, in from the ceiling, regulating exposure depending on the time of the day. Light has been simulated using computer software at intervals of 30 minutes during 12 months and manipulated accordingly. So this is the website of, uh, of this uh, architect, and this is the building. Now, why exactly this is Zen uh, is a little bit mysterious to me, but uh, this uh, website uh, describes it as such. The truth is uh, this uh, theme, uh, Zen architecture, uh, deserves to be explored. After this uh, rather short presentation, I will have a, an even shorter one uh, showing um, five Zen traditional temples and six samples of um, Zen rock gardens. This makes me think a little bit of a, of, a, of a very important building built by John Hudson, a church in Copenhagen. The multi-purpose architectonic structure designed by a award-winning Norwegian practice, Ramstad architect, is located in the Selvik. Now we go to the next building. The, the so-called object, actually, the building merges itself in the rough and inhospitable landscape while brutalist and curvy ramps draw a playful path. Visitors are given a new way to consider the beauty of nature. The concrete color and texture match the shades of gray that distinguish the rocky environment, tying and emphasizing the relationship between landscape and structure. The snaky construction gives a sense of protection as visitors enter the grueling surrounding and opening up to new perspectives and experiences. This is the website uh, address of this uh, office in Norway. And this is, uh, again, we, we see rocks like in Palm Springs, California. And this is the structure built by these Norwegian architects. And we are going to see it in more detail. Here it is. And uh, why exactly this is considered Zen, I do not know. But I imagine that if I, uh, meander through on that path, 
perhaps, and also the landscape, uh, you know, the, uh, the sea and the sky and the rocky mountains, all of these probably uh, induce uh, desire for contemplation. Reading now another work, uh, this one uh, by a Chinese uh, firm. Let's not forget, and I think this is important, and I learned myself uh, recently this, Zen came to Japan from China, and it only did so in the 12th century, uh, around the time when, uh, you know, yes, there was still the Gothic in Europe, but it developed uh, slowly uh, the Zen, uh, somehow flourished in the 14th century when in Europe there was Renaissance. And it's very interesting because the Zen went kind of the opposite way in comparison with the Renaissance. I think I have here a short text about it. Let's move on. So this, um, this uh, library by this atelier Li Xiao Dong, uh, is located in the small village of Huairu, two hours outside of busy Beijing. Truly, China is leading now is the, the experimental laboratory in architecture of the entire world. Uh, what is happening there is unbelievable, as you know. Conceived as a place for contemplation, its cocooned ambience has been created using wood and fruit tree wigs to clean the facade. Wooden sticks abundant in the area temper the bright light and camouflage the building through wooden textures found in stunning surroundings. Steps along the st single story volume create movement in the interior and allow for privacy in each room, framing views towards the mountainous landscape. This is the website of this architecture firm and they have so many now and they have this this eager young uh, Chinese architects who are uh, astonishingly creative. This is an excellent building, in my opinion. And uh, you know, when you when you think that the Zen originated actually in China, it makes sense. This is uh, you know a, a, a room and interior ambiance that is very conducive to meditation, to contemplation. Meditation is very important. For Zen, for Zen spirituality. And uh, I think it's done with sensitivity, but also with vigor. Uh, and I like the exterior very much. It's, you know, it's, it's in a way very humble. Uh, and uh, although the geometry that is used is rather, you know, rigorous, but, but the building doesn't emanate, you know, an oppressive uh, rigor. Uh, it's 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 well done. I just thought of, of, of Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier and, uh, you know, uh, Albert Frey being part of, of, the, of the project team. Now, is this building inferior to Villa Savoie? You know, I'm just asking maybe a rather inappropriate uh, uh, question, but uh, I don't know. I mean, of course, it was built uh, much later. Now we arrive at another building uh, associated with the Zen movement in a Scandinavian country, um, an interpretation, a different interpretation by Shin Zen, uh, acting with a simple gesture, the studio creates a comfortable and safe space overlooking Lake Joesa, choosing an arboretum, a small garden of trees to host this uh, care center an institution for juvenile asylum seekers. The garden aims to symbolize life and growth in a new soil, but also provides children and staff with a positive activity of cultivating the environment. Clever, cleverly placed, a series of wooden windscreens protects the guests 
and garden against the wind. Uh, this is the website of, uh, I like the shortness of the, the laconic naming of the website of this uh, Scandinavian architecture uh, team. And this is the work. Essentially, the Zen is about meditation, about contemplation. So in my opinion, we need more contemplation these days, more meditation, more spiritual activity, and less obsession with mercantilism, productivism, and consumerism. Now, another work, simple, plain, or homely kanso is a Zen concept and one of the most important elements in traditional Japanese design. Studio Phenomenons, Fumihiko Sano conceived the 40 square meters and Yuan Salon and Maru Wakaya showroom following this principle. The film produces pieces linking traditional crafts with mono zukuri contemporary art. The space is composed, composed, I don't know why the word was uh, divided, of lintels, seals, and pillars. The irregularity of distance between pillars and the different heights of each lintel generate a dynamism responding to, to the traditional concept of punkin say without symmetry. Uh, this is the website of this uh, uh, creative uh, atelier. And this is the, you know, an interior view. Uh, again, uh, Japan. After this, we are going to see uh, an interesting house in Vietnam. Who would have thought of it? But Vietnam itself is also a very creative uh, laboratory now. Uh, when you consider the misery of the long war waged by the you know, the Americans in Vietnam, and now they, they, uh, they, they do have a, an incredibly interesting architecture in Vietnam. But this is Japan. And the Zen house by uh, this uh, group, uh, this is the house that I am, uh, I was referring to, I was just referring to, by this uh, architecture office, HA. Here I have many images. So let's read a little bit about it. The Zen house was designed by H.A. The owners of Zen house are all Buddhists looking forward to having a place of peace, tranquility, and completely free from the hustle city. This is not simply a house. Zen house is a monastery. Let's see. Uh, well, if it is a monastery, <clears throat> it's a comfortable monastery and uh, you know where I would say the pleasure principle is still uh, is still present. It's not easy, you know. Uh, maybe it's uh, fashionable somehow to invoke the word Zen, uh, but there is here a serious preoccupation with bringing tranquility, uh, serenity into the building. And you see even these insertions of. Uh, you know, small references to ornamentation, even decoration, I think uh, are attempts to bring some gentleness to the building. And this is, I think, important. Even the way the light, the way the light is filtered through these screens, you know, it's rather traditional than modern, but uh, softening the atmosphere within the house uh, was a goal, I think, and uh, it's important. I like also the pieces of furniture. The Zen spirituality is a rather austere uh, spirituality. Now, maybe the pieces of furniture are Zen, if we are to call them so, because of the, the you know, uh, almost stark um, you know, geometry it makes me think a little bit of some pieces by Adolf Loos, but it's it's fine, it's fine. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the the doors, the entrance doors, as you can see, they are ornamental, uh, and again, the, the the presence of the ornament softens the potentially uh, you know hard uh, 
modernism of the house. What is interesting in this house is that, you know, you think here you are outside, but you are still inside the house. So you have a door, this kind of door that opens towards the atrium like, you know, living room here. Uh, an interesting uh, complexity or hybridity even. I hope that person doesn't fall, um, but I like the fact that she doesn't have shoes. Uh, look at this bulb here hanging in a, you know, uh, I would say undesigned way. But uh, I, I like this, you know, reducing to simplicity. Here is also a, a bulb, uh, kind of like in uh, Le Corbusier a little bit. You know, yes, yes, it can be done in this way, in, in, in simple ways. It's remarkable how, you know, sophisticated these Vietnamese architects are in the field of modernity and they arrived at modernity late. And look at the house, it's, it's, it's not a bad house. What I like also about it is that it got rid of the, the excessively white walls. I mean, there is a little bit of whiteness here, but otherwise, you know, it's rather dark. And uh, maybe that darkness also is conducive to some kind of interiorization, uh, some kind of, you know, meditation or a contemplative mood. Now, of course, this is not a house for everybody, but uh, you know, nor is Villa Savoie or was Villa Savoie, nor the falling water for that matter. Not that I'm necessarily comparing this building with those buildings, but uh, I think for our time and maybe not just for our time, it's a good building. And you see here there are, you know, you say imperfections. But I think they are very welcomed. You know, they uh, maybe they were even done intentionally. We are going to see also the flooring in the main room or the living room. Also, I think these so-called uh, imperfections warm up, uh, warm up the building. Yes, I imagine they were done intentionally. So, you know, uh, the perfection of imperfection, if you want. Yes, I would feel myself uh, a, a desire to sit on this chair and, you know, meditate or contemplate. I like about this house the fact that it is both modern and traditional somehow. It, it has uh, a subtle uh, mixture between the two. Buddhism is a very tolerant uh, religion and, uh, you know, there are many people even in, in the Christian world who actually, uh, you know, turn to Buddhism. Because paradoxically, you know, the, the monotheistic religions, uh, Judaism, uh, Islam and uh, Christianity, although they spring from the same source, from Abraham, they are at war with each other. I don't know why. They are in fact good relatives. I think the incorporation of, of the old into the new is an inspired one. And you have the coexistence between two uh, different architectural languages, this one and this one. And yet they somehow relate. 
you know, this is white and metallic, this is wood, but then you have these, uh, you know, elements which here are vertical. It's a coexistence between the, 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 the new and the old. Vietnam, the Zen house. Actually, the the you know the imprint um, the you know the so the the surface of the area on the ground level is not big, but its uh, its growth vertically is rather impressive. I don't know how Zen this, uh, but. Uh, the Zen spirituality is paradoxical, so maybe the paradox is I worked myself for a Zen uh, office, so to speak, in in the United States for about half a year, uh, and uh, I remember a funny thing. I was working actually on the project for the headquarters of the Zen Society in in New York, and. Uh, uh, the the owner of the firm told me that uh, the architect told me that there was a an, uh, they had uh, an amount of marble uh, and that I should search for a place where to use it and uh, so I you know I envisioned uh, certain parts of the building where to use that marble and he told me because I wanted to use the marble in uh, you know in the front elevation they didn't have they didn't have too much marble. So I thought to use it in some, you know, so-called important parts of the building. And he said, no, 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 use it where the garbage containers are, meaning in the back of the, of the building, use the marble. This is actually very Zen, you know, it's, it's, it's provocative, it's, it's paradoxical. You know, use the marble in the place, in the least so-called important place of the building, you know, and, but I, I kind of understand it because the, the Zen mentality is like this, you know, to, to, to create some kind of a, an unexpected balance. Instead of using the marble for the main elevation, you use it, uh, you know, to adorn the, the, the walls around the, you know, the garbage containers. Strange. Strange, but also interesting. Uh, Anyway, here is a section through this building in Vietnam. Mostly the light comes from above.
when you look at the plants, you, you don't imagine the easily the you know the scale of the building and the variety of spaces. And that's because of the alternation between open spaces and enclosed spaces. Is a room within the room. Uh, here, even the you know the washing, uh, you know the bathroom is 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 uh, is not attached uh, to the to the room. There is a transition, and uh, it's interesting, I think. And these interstitial spaces. Are, are uh, very effective, you know, these, these spaces. I call them interstitial. I think they work very well. You can tell it's not a big building because, you know, this is the kitchen uh, counter. And you know, with a few pieces of furniture, it's it's almost like a regular size living room, and kitchen and the bathroom, and that's all there is on this floor. With one uh, window here, otherwise the light comes from above. Okay, and now uh, this is the website where I, I found uh, I found uh, this material about this Zen house. Ze uh, I, I, I found this equation about Zen, which I like very much. Zero equals abundance. Usually we do not think this way at all. What do you mean zero equals abundance? But this is very true of the Zen spirituality or mentality you know to 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 arrive at, at fullness uh by by uh, in a way the the presence of absence you arrive at fullness by eliminating anything superfluous you know uh, longing for that zero absolute zero where the zero becomes abundance i love this equation zero equals abundance and here you see some kind of a I don't know how to call it a diagram, ideogram. So this is simple simplicity. Then you have modernism. Well, unfortunately, the colors as I saw them on the website are not here rep reproduced properly. But the Zen design is a, some kind of an intersection between minimalism, simplicity, modernism, and Japanese traditional design. It's somewhere here, the Zen design. Japanese traditional design, minimalism, modernism, and simplicity. And you see, the Zen was brought to Japan, uh, you know, at the end of the 12th, you know, uh, I mean, the year 1200 approximately. Unfortunately, here they didn't reproduce. There were other uh, notations about the. It 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 achieved, uh, you know. Uh, cohesiveness uh, around the uh, 1400s about the time when when uh, in europe we we had uh, renaissance but this was acting in the opposite direction i hope i have here text about this uh, no i don't but i read about it that while europe uh, generated a very rich and assertive renaissance in japan Zen provoked a revolution in the opposite direction, reducing, reducing, reducing towards uh, reticence, towards minimalism, towards that zero which equaled abundance. That definition of abundance was not to be present in, 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 uh, in Europe during the Renaissance, uh, far from it. Anyway, the beauty of absence. Maybe we can, uh, we can think more about about uh, this. I wouldn't really call it minimalism, but from the perspective of the present, yes, we could say that minimalism could have an austerity and the simplicity that could be approximated with uh, what Zen stood for. Now I'm going to show a very remarkable uh, Zen garden, maybe the most remarkable of all. Uh, 
uh, truly, uh, and there are very scholarly uh, works that describe this mysterious and complex uh, Zen rock garden. The Zen garden in, in the Ryoani temple in Kyoto. Kyoto was and is the spiritual capital of Japan, although it's a very developed and modern city, but it has countless temples and countless Zen gardens. And this is the most famous of them all. Truly a beautiful, beautiful garden. The Zen garden of this uh, temple, Ryoani-ji, is famous for its simplicity made of nothing but clay walls, raked, raked sand, and 15 rocks. Uh, well, there is something else, and we see a little bit of green, you see here, the moss around the stone. But this is one of the most famous gardens in the world, if not the most famous. It is magnificent. It's an imago mundi. It is an image of the world not just the terrestrial world, but also the celestial world. I read that if you sit and contemplate on the veranda or around the, 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 the garden, the garden, the stones seem to appear to slowly move. Uh, there is a text, uh, and I don't know if I have here the, the, the website address, where a very lengthy uh, presentation of this uh, formidable garden uh, uh, by a professor of philosophy at the University of Nevada. And he says that this garden is able to, uh, in a way, uh, uh, reunite or unite the opposites. It's, it's both static and dynamic. The rocks, you know, they are a paradigm of stability. But somehow, uh, it seems that in this garden, whose authors are unknown, uh, um, the, the rocks seem to somehow uh, move, although obviously they don't move and they don't move for centuries, because this is a, an, an old, uh, a very old work. Look at, the, look at the sea of sand, which is raked every day by the monks who take care of this, uh, of this temple. Look at this clay wall here with its imperfections and its modesty. I think it's, it's, it's sublime, it's, it's magnificent, you know, exactly because of its reticence and its, its modesty. Um, I, I love this garden. I never traveled to Japan, but, uh, uh, you know, even from these pictures, I, uh, I think I think this is a major work uh, in all its modesty and our austerity. It is major because it's about a wisdom that we don't have any longer. Look at the look at the, this raked sand. You know, uh, it's so simple and yet so complex. And you wonder how did these people do it? Were they lifted by a helicopter so the the traces of the uh, the footprints? are not shown here, it's, it's almost, it's miraculous. And here it is, the monk. I read that every day the monks take care of the sand because you can imagine, you know, a little bit of wind or rain or anything disturbs the perfection of the work. This is about spirit. It's as simple as this. It's about spirit to dedicate your life to spirit something we don't even think of. And I think that this uh, pandemic and this virus uh, is suggesting to us to move in this direction, to change our way of life, to become more, uh, more attentive to other issues in life. And here is one suggestion. And this garden is, uh, is sublime, you know, and it's very old and at the same time, it's very new. Bravo to it. Look at these people here, all, uh, you know, contemplating or re writing or it's, it, yes, it is an imago mundi. You don't need Mr. Musk uh, to go to, to Mars. You have Mars here. You have the entire cosmos here in Kyoto in this beautiful and very modest garden. Uh, I wish I knew more 
fact, facts about it. Uh, there are books written about this garden. Uh, and, uh, but I just let my emotions uh, externalize themselves through the words I, 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 I whisper now. And, uh, you know, if you are interested, you can, you can, you can read more. Look, look again at the beauty of these old clay walls. You know, they, I, I feel I'm speechless actually, because this is real beauty. It's wise beauty. That's how I would call it. Now, maybe all true beauty is wise. I don't know. Um, so you have sand, you have rocks, you have the moss. The only, well, I read in the text that, which I read by that professor of philosophy, that usually we associate gardens with uh, vegetable materials and with water. Water, because you cannot have, you know, uh, plants grow without water. But the Zen garden got rid of the water. These are dry gardens with rocks, but no water. Uh, the only, uh, you know, live material, so to speak, are these uh, little islands of green, the moss around the around the stones, uh, around the, the around the rocks. It's very beautiful. This this lake, artificial lake of dust, not of dust, of, uh, of sand, and uh, and the rocks is are, are you know I mean this you know just this rock somehow looks like a pensive uh, human being seen from the back. Uh, it, it's I mean th this just like the builders of the Parthenon in Athens, these were these gardeners were philosophers. You know, the art of gardening to arrive at such complexity and beauty, simple beauty, requires thinkers. You know, uh, we don't think of gardeners as being thinkers or philosophers, but these were very beautiful work. I mean, my I should be silent actually. It's really about eternity, but it's also about becoming. It's being and becoming eternity, but also ephemerality or transitoriness. It's both. And it's done with, yes, you have the stones, the rocks, which are rocks, and these are, you know, here for, for many centuries, but the sand, you know, it's 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 almost a, a paradigm of uh, instability or fragility. The beauty, beautiful meditation on life and death and the beyond. And look at the nature around the temple itself, magnificent. Bravo to the Japanese. Now the stones are thought of being inert, but I'm, I'm not so sure. What if the stones have their own soul and we just don't know of it, of, you know, uh, but everything here is, is, is it's almost sublime in its modesty, you know, even this moss, you know, and the, and the sand and the rocks. You cannot do something like this with our prosaic mercantile mind. It's impossible. For this, you, you have to have a, a contemplative mind. Uh, so the, this is the rock garden of the Ryuanji. I don't know if I pronounce well Ryuanji temple. And there are all kinds of uh, analyses and, uh, you know, you can find drawings and, uh, you know, it's a work very famous and it, it was analyzed, you know, from various points of view. So the entire composition is very peaceful. The garden surely exhibits a balance in its static and dynamic effects. Or, or perhaps I should say, the one who wrote, and I think this is that the professor of philosophy, I should say that the garden presents 
a balance between its impressions of motionless and motion. To speak paradoxically, it would appear to present the viewer with an overwhelming impression of unmoving motion. Let's repeat it, unmoving motion. The garden is unmoving, and yet it is seeming, seemingly moving. We can also see an harmony too in the upward and sideward motions. All the rocks within the clusters move together both upwards and leftwards, and all the clusters together would seem to move in both ways. The clusters form triangles in harmony each with itself and with each other. Indeed, the large and small triangles fit together in a way uh, that lends balance to the garden space. The harmony of motion and rest and of upward and sideward motion would actually appear to constitute a paradigm of the universe. Does not the universe exhibit both motion and rest? Does it not exhibit upward and admittedly downward motion? And does it not, does not the universe move forward, at least metaphorically, through time? This harmony seems a paradigm for our own nature as well. We are continuously in motion, in motion and at rest. Are we not? We are the same, and yet we are not the same. We have an identity, but change and move forward through time, and we come to be, and eventually we cease to be. Well written. We surely owe a debt of gratitude to those who designed the garden, both for the garden itself and for for its insights. My fear is that my interpretation, this is the person at the bottom who wrote this, my fear is that my interpretation may not measure up to their intention. If I am right, these humble gardeners present us less with a paradox than with a paradigm, a paradigm of our very life. As life in the garden is an illusion, and so is our life. And yet our life, through an illusion can be a thing of tranquility and harmony and beauty and sublimity, perhaps. The garden surely is, and our life surely can be, should we but wish, wish it. Bravo to Paul Schollmeyer, because I think he wrote in an inspired and inspiring way. Let's read again. The garden, this garden, surely is, and our life surely can be, should we but wish it. This is what we miss today badly. We meet miscontemplation. We are so absorbed by our frenetic um, obsession with uh, action, 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 and action that we forgot to interiorize uh, you know, our thoughts and to, to, to meditate, to contemplate. It's extremely important to bring back to life contemplation, even if the price we pay is less production. But, uh, you know, the obsession with production and consumption is not a good one. So here is written, uh, not very well translated, <clears throat> The Zen world is centered on austerity, self-control, courage, and loyalty and meditation, which is key to enlightenment. The meticulous arrangements of raked sand circling around proeminently placed stones and gardens, which contains no water, are ultimately serve for spiritual refreshment, a place of contemplation and rejuvenation. I read it actually the first, the first feeling you have uh, when you enter uh, here is the feeling of emptiness. And then, but, but is that zero-ness that actually is actuated by abundance? And then the more you contemplate it, then you realize that that first feeling of emptiness is actually turning into something else of an unexpected fullness.
essentially they are you know these clusters of stones of rocks in a sea of sand so in a sea without water there are all kinds of uh, you know uh, analyses and uh, you know uh, descriptions of this very very simple but also very very sophisticated work it's it's a philosophical work actually uh, done by uh, anonymous gardeners who in my opinion were much wiser than i am let's not say we are and now i will end this um, short and imperfect uh, uh, you know trip into the field of uh, zen uh, gardening uh, zen architecture with a with a very short uh, presentation of five uh, zen uh, temples and uh, six uh, zen gardens well one of the six is actually the one that we just saw in uh, rather detail so zen temples of gardens i took this material from from the web uh, the text is a little bit uh, commercial is destined for tourists and uh, you know i uh, ask for forgiveness for that but maybe you know for as a short introduction uh, to this field is uh, is acceptable uh, this is what uh, suzuki wrote there is no need to have a deep understanding of zen this is again a very you know provocative and paradoxical statement there is no need to have a deep understanding of zen uh, this is uh, less than simple but uh, You'll see that actually, uh, well, from what I read, uh, while Zen imported from China had a big influence on, on the aesthetics of, of Japan, Japan also had another side to its culture, which was not at all uh, based on, uh, on uh, you know, minimalism, if we, had to, if we had to call it so, but rather on maximalism. And we can see here on the ceiling an example of that. So Zen Buddhism has an ascetic image, but at the same time, there is an air of mystery around it. What better place to try to get to know more about Zen than the historic capital of Japan, Kyoto. Attaining Satori, enlightenment, while traveling in Kyoto might be a bit difficult because yes, it's a metropolis, but at least you can see some incredibly beautiful temples. So, there are five temples, which I'll show with just one image. Five life-changing Zen Buddhist temples in Kyoto. The Kenin-ji temple, um, you know, rock garden, Zen, Zen rock garden, just that we, we saw previously, but this is a different, uh, a different temple. This is the most famous for, is most famous for its twin dragons. The huge black dragons on the ceiling look almost to be alive, but Kenning G has more to offer than just the dragons and convenient access on that street. They have 16 ceramic figures of famous Buddhist saints for you, you to see. Plus the whatever stamp book is rather cool. It has a dragon on its cover. Anyway, this is the language to attract tourists. Another temple, Nanzenji temple. Um, I envy these Japanese for the multitude of their temples. You can imagine this is a, a, a nation where the, the past and spirit are present in the everyday, and their everyday is also highly technologized. This temple uh, area is just huge, and there is really a lot to see. The temple area having many sub temples, plus, of course, the famous Sanmon Gate. Is a popular tourist destination, but if you go into the gardens or to the temples around the main one, there won't be so many people and you can have a quiet moment for yourself and contemplate in peace. Another temple, Tofukuji Temple. Uh, this one is more ornate. Uh, you wouldn't say that it's very austere uh, or minimalist, but it's very, it has, it's very dignified. Like many of the Zen temples in Kyoto, this temple is also the head of its own sect, the Tokufu Shi School of the Rinzai sect. Interestingly, the name 
is a combination of Todaiji and Kofukuji temples in Nara. But this temple has to be most famous for its rock gardens that surround the Hojo, the Abbot's Hall, which are just spectacular. Also, don't forget uh, Tofukuji if you are going to Kyoto during the autumn, autumn leaf season. The views are just spectacular. Another temple, Tenryuji Temple. Uh, and yes, they are splendid. And they are splendid because they, 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 they display this, uh, this uh, joyous uh, spirituality, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, this other side of life that we unfortunately forgot most of the time in our Hari. So this temple is a Zen temple, not only famous for its rock garden, but also the garden as a whole, especially the way the garden beautifully uses the mountains surrounding the temple as a part of the garden design, a concept in Japanese known as shakei. This also means that the garden design to be enjoyed every season of the year. So every time you go, you are going to get to see a different view of the garden. Now we arrive at the temple that we just uh, had a larger presentation about and its famous garden, but uh, we saw the garden, but we didn't see the temple. We are, going, we are not going to see it either because the garden is the centerpiece. Last but not least, from these five temples, we have the Ryuanji temple, the temple that makes you think with its garden. As I try to suggest, indeed, those gardeners who, who built it, if we are to use the verb to build, we're thinkers, we're philosophers. There are four mysteries that nobody knows the answer for. Who built the garden? What do the 15 rocks of the rock garden represent? The optical illusion that makes the garden seem to have more depth than it does. And the earthen wall made out of a mix of clay and rapeseed oil that has survived the test of time. This temple is a great end on our series of the five life-changing Zen temples, and it has a, as it has a rock garden, a beautiful Hojo Abbot's Hall, and even a restaurant <laughs> offering Buddhist cuisine. Anyway, I have a moisture in my mouth now, and now I end this uh, very short and, and imperfect presentation about the Zen architecture and gardens with the six most beautiful Zen rock gardens in Kyoto. This one at the temple of Daito Kuji in uh, Kita. Um, well, if we compare this with, uh, with uh, the one that we studied more in detail, we see here more agitation. I prefer the other one. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is another you know, variation on, uh, on, uh, on, on this theme of, of the sand, uh, sand garden, of, of, of the rock gardens, of the garden where a few rocks, uh, you know, are surrounded by, a, 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 if I am to call it so, a sea of sand. If you'd like to learn a little more about Zen garden, landscape and history, this temple is the place to go first. This sprawling Zen temple complex in the north of the city has a range of rock gardens hidden away among several sub-temples. Uh, anyway, another temple with a rock garden. Uh, you see the rock gardens are very different one from the other. They also somehow seem newer, uh, but uh, I, I, I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they are as old as the one we, we, we looked at in the first presentation. So it's a prime viewing spot for autumn foliage, which shrouds the temple grounds in red, gold, and orange in late November. Aside from the natural beauty surrounding the Buddhist temple, including a lush bamboo grove, there is also a Zen garden, which is deliberately left unfinished. Uh, think about this, it's deliberately left unfinished. And you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a Zen garden, which eliminates the water, but it leaves the, 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 the river bed there. So you complete the, the garden in your imagination. It is, it is through the participation of your uh, imagination 
the imagination of the viewer that the garden is completed. Why the, why the, gar why the gardener deciding not to mark the boundaries of the space with stones is left open to interpretation, but the temple suggests perhaps the gardener hoped visitors would complete the image of the garden in their own minds, exactly what I tried to say before. The garden's white gravel is raked in such a way that it resembles a cloudy sky and surrounds a stone set that represents a flying dragon. Uh, again, it's about meditation, it's about contemplation, it's about what we ignore these days. This is the one we, we, we studied, so to speak, more in detail, and we saw it, and it's, it's, it, is, it is by far the most reticent and the deepest. A uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site, Rioanji, Rioanji houses what is arguably the nation's most famous rock garden. While the Zen temple itself was established in 1450, by Hosokawa Katsumoto, a deputy to the Shogun dynasty. The year the garden was first built is still a matter of fierce debate. Some theories say that Katsumoto's son was the man behind the garden. Others think the famous 16th century artist Swami was the one who created it. Plus the garden's origin is not its only mystery. From a puzzling carving with the name Kotaro behind one of the garden's 15 stones to its asymmetrical formations, the garden is full of riddles that leave many visitors contemplating the meaning behind this serene space. Though the larger rocks are untouched, the garden's gravel is raked daily by the monks at the temple. Now another temple in Ukiyo, uh, you see here we have a lot of vegetation and a lot of water because the plants need the water. So part of this temple, you can see a range of gardens from different periods, including the Motonobu no Niva, a rock garden with evergreen plants, which, designed, uh, which is designed as an expression of unchanging beauty. And this Inio no Niva garden, which is all about the the interplay between shadow and sunlight. Each garden contrasts with and complements the others like a rock garden sample set. Another one, Tofukuji, we are approaching the end of the presentation. Um, you know, this one maybe is not uh, taking us a lot by surprise. Essentially, you have the same elements, the rocks, the, the, you know, the sea, so to speak, of, of sand, and then uh, you have some moss and uh, the surra surrounding walls. Uh, these were built by the famous land architect uh, Shigemori in 1939 and are arranged in the four quarters surrounding the. So this is a newer, a newer rock garden. The rocks are said to symbolize heavenly islands named Eiji, Horai, Korion, Hojo, anyway, whereas the gravel represents eight rough seas. The Eastern Garden is characterized by seven cylindrical stones in a moss field that represents the constellation Ursa Major, otherwise known as the Big Dipper. The temple's Western and Northern Gardens, though also classified as stone gardens, diverge from the rigidity of the Southern and Western Gardens by incorporating green formations of moss. I would say here something that I, I believe is important. To, to attempt to bring back, to bring to the earth the above, like here, the constellation Ursa Major, to, 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 to find some correspondence on earth of what is above on sky. Another temple in Sakio, and you see another uh, garden with a more, uh, again, I think the most by far, uh, the most impressive is the one where you know, the, the, the vegetation is uh, reduced to a, uh, to a minimum. A little off the beaten track, this uh, temple offers a quieter rock garden experience with a large rock turtle and a gravel stream, so-called stream, because there is no water. It also offers a unique activity, making your own rock garden dessert. 
You can create an edible miniature rock garden by scattering candy created to look like pebbles on top of a silken green tea tiramisu made by local confectioner this. That's it. So with this, we end our presentation today.